Well, thanks for inviting me. Um, it's nice to see you, Chris. Long time since I saw you. Chris used to work for me in the cardiac department at Queen's. I'm going to show you um, a few ECGs. I can't show you all the ones you'll get in your practice because they're all the ones that I see in my practice. You've already heard that you've got increased risk factors. You will see patients with coronary heart disease. They get all sorts of wonderful ECG abnormalities. The ECG is just really a delicate voltmeter. It's quite clever because it filters out a lot of skeletal muscle interference. It doesn't do as well in Parkinson's. They present particular problems. For those who don't know a lot about the ECG, this is a typical ECG squiggle. I'm a squiggle doctor. Generally speaking, the bigger the wave, the more muscle has activated it. And the larger the wave, sorry, the longer the wave, the longer it's taken the electricity to pass through the heart. And each phase of the heart generates a different bit of the squiggle. This, the wiring system of the heart is very simple. Um, it's far more complicated to wire a house, believe me. Um, signal usually starts off at the top. It passes through a regulator, which tells things to just slow down, calm down, don't get too excitable. Otherwise, whatever happens at the top of the heart is transmitted to the bottom of the heart. So if your heart at the top decides to go at 200 beats a minute, the bottom will try and keep up with it, which, unless you're a trained athlete, is probably not a good idea. So the regulator stops that. So we can start at the top with the sinoatrial node, which generates a wave. And if you look at the top right-hand corner of your automated ECG report, you'll see a, a, a squiggle to tell you about the P wave, whether it's there or not. The wave then passes to the AV node, which introduces a delay. This is the calming down bit. It's the PR segment. The wave is then passed down to motorway systems, to the left side of the heart and the right side of the heart, which generates this large wave. Now, if you've had a heart attack, that wave will get smaller, and sometimes you'll see a, a Q wave. This little squiggle here gets very deep, showing heart damage. The heart then goes through a phase of recovery, which generates a T wave. And the important thing for some of your patients is the time between the Q and the end of the T, the QT interval. It's going to be upset by some of your drugs and put your patients at risk of a potentially fatal dysrhythmia. This is a normal ECG. I'm not sure how well it shows at the back, but you'll see it's dead regular. Each of these spikes shows a heartbeat, and it goes, heart's told to beat, heart beats, heart recovers. Told to beat, beat, recover. Told to beat, beat, recover. And it's usually dead regular. Now, what I see in daily practice is slow heart rhythms, fast heart rhythms, and a lot of anxiety due to the automated interpretation. Um, <laughs> The easiest to deal with are these. <laughs> the next easiest are these, because basically, if your heart's going too slowly, it's usually due to drugs or disease. If it's disease, a pacemaker sorts it out. These can be real buggers to sort out sometimes, because it usually happens acutely. It's usually in fairly sick people to start with, and they get sicker and sicker because they're on the coronary care unit. As a general rule with fast heart rates, they can be narrow complex. You can get these. My daughter gets them. Um, she is quite a good athlete. She knows how to treat hers when they happen. She did the Great North Run recently, and we found with her, all we have to do is get her to press her carotid artery. Carotid sinus massage stops her palpitations quite easily, even during a race. The harder ones to treat are usually these things. The complex, instead of being narrow, are very broad. And it's usually ischemic heart disease. The risks that you've been hearing about generate disease in the coronary arteries, and put people at risk of this, as do some of your psychotropic drugs. Now, a resting heart rate is normally about 60 to 70 beats a minute, but it can be slowed down with vascular disease, all the things you've been hearing about. But they can also be affected by some of the things that I use on a daily basis. Beta blockers and calcium channel blockers frequently used to treat angina, hypertension, and also after a heart attack. Digoxin we use less these days, but it's a quite in cause of a slow heart rate. And some of the antiarrhythmics that I use can be quite potent too. So with sinus bradycardia, the signal in the sinus node is told to slow down for whatever reason. And it looks like this. The gaps between the toe to beat get wider and wider. You've still got a little squiggle that says, beat now. You've still got a squiggle that says, I'm beating. You've still got a beat that says, I'm now recovering. 
It's just they get wider and wider apart. Now that can make you feel tired. And when we give people beta blockers after a heart attack, one of the reasons why they feel knackered is because beta blockers can quite severely slow your heart down. It can affect your blood pressure, it can make you dizzy, collapse, and breathless. The consequence is, well, you can just feel a bit tired. But if you feel tired and dizzy at the top of a flight of stairs, you can fall down, the heart rate then becomes unimportant, it's the fractured skull and the fractured hip at the bottom that matters. Now, what's important for those who use memory drugs is it has an effect on the sinus node. And some people have a sick sinus. It doesn't beat rhythmically like a metronome all the time. It has little gaps. So you'll see, toe to beat, beat, recover, toe to beat, beat, recover, just jump one, toe to beat, beat, recover, then there's a gap. In that gap, you've got no cardiac output. When you've got no cardiac output, the brain doesn't like it, it starts to complain. If you read the data sheet on the drugs that you use to enhance memory, you will see, be cautious in sick sinus syndrome. How do you know you've got it? Well, the thing is, unless you get symptoms, or somebody does a tape, tape recording, you don't know you've got it. So I'd recommend if you start somebody on a memory enhancing drug, do an ECG. If they complain of dizziness, then I think you should be cautious about using the drug. It can get worse. If you look at the bottom line, these squiggles start to get wider apart and then there's a six second pause. Now that would be tolerated poorly by everybody in this room. It can cause dizziness, collapse and breathlessness and all the consequences, particularly falling down. It can get worse. You can separate the top of the heart from the bottom of the heart and get something called complete heart block. Now, if you look closely, you'll see down here that these toe-to-beat beats are all over the place. There's no clear relationship between the, I'm going to beat now and recovery. They're separated. So the top's beating at one speed and the bottom is beating, uh, beating at quite another. And this is usually going at about 70 beats a minute. By itself, this will go at about 36 to 40 beats a minute. It's easier to sort out. You stick a pacemaker in. But that too can cause dizziness, collapse, and breathlessness. So if one of your patients complains of this, if you can't get an ECG, stick a finger on a pulse. It will tell you important information. If it's a slow heartbeat, it'll be obvious. If it's a very slow heartbeat, it could easily be complete heart block. And this will happen in some of your older patients because this wiring gets a bit fragile as you get older. And it gets hammered by ischemic heart disease, furring up of the coronary arteries and they can break down completely. You can get wear out of just part of the wiring system. The bit that goes down to the left side of the heart goes a little bit slower than the bit down the right hand side of the heart. And that makes the complexes look quite bizarre. If you look up here, wide. And the bit that looks like total recover is very abnormal. It's just because this now has to take a very abnormal route to recover. But that's a quite classic thing that you'll see in ischemic heart disease. And it's always best to assume that so this person's got structural ischemic heart disease until somebody tells you otherwise. That's often asymptomatic. Some of the older members of the audience may well have this, but I didn't bring my ECG machine. Probably the commonest thing you come across is sinus tachycardia. Now, every patient who goes to Rampton first day probably has a fast heartbeat where the sinus node is bombarded by impulses from the sympathetic nervous system that says, things are going to happen to you, you better get ready. This is preparation for running away from a saber-toothed tiger. It's your self-defense mechanism. And so all you see is the same sort of toe-to-beat, beat, recover, toe-to-beat, beat, recover, but it happens faster. It's often asymptomatic. Fortunately, otherwise, most people on television would be obviously in sinus tachycardia. Some people are lucky enough to have an extra wire when they're born. Instead of having the one wire joining the top of the heart at the bottom, they got another one. Now that can cause problems in itself because that alters the ECG. And if I just point you to this particular complex, you'll see there's no gap between the toe to beat and the beat. This is because the impulse is jumped around the regulator, 
and it's activated at the bottom of the heart quickly. And the bit that goes through the red line, the bypass tract, is this bit that slopes up in this fashion. Instead of going straight up, it's slurred. And that can cause problems because your heart can go very, very fast. Because the signal can go from the top of the heart, down the bypass tract, to the bottom of the heart, back up to the top, back down to the bottom, back up to the top, and so on. So you can go to 200, 300 beats a minute very quickly, which of course will make you dizzy, collapse, and breathless. Does this sound boring? This is exactly what hearts usually do. They respond in very typical ways. This is easy to treat. We can stick wires in the heart, and we can burn away that bit, and it's gone forever. Now, some people, like my daughter, get this thing called narrow complex tachycardia, where the atria, the top of the heart, starts sending lots and lots of signals to the bottom of the heart. And the regulator does its best to calm things down. But unfortunately, it's fighting a losing battle. You see, the heart here is going very, very fast. They're called narrow complexes because the total beat, beat is narrow. You'll see a broader one in a few minutes. That's easier to treat, but it does cause dizziness, collapse, and breathlessness. Now, this can be self-terminating. It can switch on and switch off itself, or like my daughter, you can press your neck. And you see the heart's going very, very fast, and all of a sudden, it decides, oh, go back to normal. So you've got here, toe to beat, beat, recover, toe to beat, beat, recover. It's harder to see that in the fast, narrow complexes. As your patients get older, and as they get coronary heart disease, they're likely to get something called atrial fibrillation, where more bits in the top of the heart try to send signals down to the bottom. And this makes the heartbeat look very irregular. It's fast. And if you look at the distance between two complexes, it's very different with every heartbeat. Now, this is very important to find out because not only do you get dizziness, collapse, and breathlessness, what you can get are clots forming in the atrium. If they stay there, that's fine. The trouble is that when your atrium goes back to normal and gives a good squeeze, all the rubbish, the clots that built up in the atrium now get ejected. And so there's a big campaign to try and get people to take pulses more regularly to see if they've got atrial fibrillation. If so, do an ECG, because clots in the heart can be prevented with a drug called warfarin. And there are some newer forms around which are probably better than warfarin. One thing you do know about with some of your nasty drugs, these antipsychotics, is the long QT syndrome. This is where it takes a long time for the heart to recover and get back to normal. Now, when you give somebody an antipsychotic, the QT interval lengthens, and that puts patients at risk of a potentially fatal dysrhythmia. Um, if you look at, let's say, this complex here, there's the toe to beat, there's the beat, and there's the recovery. It's delayed a long time. Now, generally speaking, that should be about 430 to 460 milliseconds. Now, you don't have to measure this. The machine does it for you. But if it gets to 500 milliseconds or more, then you're putting your patients at risk, particularly if you give them an antipsychotic, and they're at risk of sudden death. Now, if you're using a drug for schizophrenia, these people are already two to four times increased risk of sudden death anyway. You've already heard about the diabetes. Here's another abnormality with schizophrenia. It is avoidable. We can put in a very fancy defibrillator so that it will recognize this particular problem if they decide to go very fast and cardiovert it, get your heart back to normal. There's an even more specialized thing which I haven't seen for some time. It's called Brugada. This gives you a very bizarre ECG. The trouble is that some of your machines look at this and say, this to me looks like right bundle branch block. The trouble is it isn't, because right bundle branch block is a perfectly benign finding in the majority of people. In right bundle branch block, this pathway from the top to the bottom that goes down the right-hand side into the right ventricle can get blocked and slow conduction. But when you've got Brigadi, you've got a much more complex problem with all the heart cells, which gives you this quite bizarre ECG pattern. And that is a risk of sudden death. Now, we tend not to get the first person in the family who has this because they usually drop down dead. They have a post-mortem, and the pathologist can't find any abnormality. And it's usually in a young person. 
So we get the rest of the family in, and we do ECGs, and we find this sort of thing. So we get the second person in the family, and we put in the defibrillator, and they're perfectly safe. A more interest to you with your antipsychotics is this thing called broad complex tachycardia. That's where you've got a substrate down here which says, I'm going to start taking over the beating of the heart. Forget the top, it's unimportant. I'm going to dictate the speed of the heart. The trouble is, because the impulse starts at the bottom of the heart, you don't get coordinated flow of electricity through the heart, so you don't get coordinated contraction of the heart, so the cardiac output goes down, so you get dizzy and breathless and so on. This looks very bizarre. You can see it's quite fast, and the complex is now quite wide. If you see this, this is a medical emergency. I assume you've all been trained in defibrillation. Show of hands. Okay. How many people have actually had to use a defibrillator in the last year? We found when we were training ambulance paramedics that unless they use their skills, their skills decayed by the end of the year. So you do need refresher courses. Now, I had to work in a private finance initiative hospital in Nottingham. I was told if I didn't work in it, under secondment, there wouldn't be any work for me in Nottingham. So that, that sort of concentrates the mind a bit. So I worked in this place, and they said, you've got to have resuscitation training. I said, but I'm a cardiologist. And they said, yes, but you've got to have defibrillation training. So I went along, and I had basic resuscitation training, which is really, that was it. And the chap said, when did you last have any defibrillator training? And I thought, I think 1984. <laughs> but if I had lots of practice since then, because when you start sticking tubes in people's hearts, they get rather irritable. So Mr. Sparky and I are old friends. So again, this causes dizziness, collapse, breathlessness, and it can be more severe. It can cause sudden death. It can be an intermittent problem. So if you take someone's pulse and you find it's every now and again got a little burst like this, and then every time there's a normal beat, you do need to do an ECG urgently and get this person to hospital if you see anything like this. What you don't want to see is ventricular fibrillation. Now, everybody watches casualty or ER or something like that. Every now and then you see Mr. Sparky comes out and they zap somebody. This is what it looks like. Actually, this is a bit of a cheat because this is a 12 lead ECG in ventricular fibrillation. Now, you don't normally see a 12 lead ECG in ventricular fibrillation. You normally see a single rhythm strip. We couldn't get this person out of ventricular fibrillation so we thought we'd do an ECG just to see what it looked like. So all these leads are the same. They're broad. Every time you see one of these squiggles, it's just a bit of electricity. The heart's actually not doing anything. It's just doing this. It's a bag of worms. There's no cardiac output. You're going to die unless somebody comes along and resuscitates it with a, either an implantable defibrillator or the paramedics come along, or you come along and zap them. Now... There are a couple of other things I want to show you, um, and then I'm going to shut up. It's very important, if you see something like this, that you act immediately. If you look up here, you'll see there's the toe to beat, there's the beat, but the recovery looks like a saddle. This person's having a heart attack, and it's affecting that view of the heart, that view of the heart, that view of the heart, and these three as well. So that's a large heart attack. This person needs to be got to hospital quickly. You all know the immediate treatment. Give an aspirin, get an ECG monitor on, get Mr. Sparky charged up just in case, and call the paramedics urgently. If you see this, medical emergency. You will see this because your patient is getting older. A lot have got diabetes, raised cholesterol, high blood pressure, all the risks that we associate with coronary heart disease. And you will, at some stage, see an infarct in your hospital if you haven't seen one already. If you see this, let me find a good one. Look at this lead here. You see, the recovery phase is now pushed downwards. This is a sign of myocardial ischemia. This is a threatened heart attack, if you like. This person needs seeing by, I hate to say doctor, but I mean a medical doctor in hospital quickly. Because this, too, is easily treatable. And... If it's allowed to progress, it could easily go onto that. So what you have to do is apply all the same sort of treatment, aspirin, ECG, 
call the paramedics, get them to hospital, and get that sorted out. Now, I hadn't anticipated saying any more. The common things you will see, memory drugs, sick sinus syndrome, dizzy, breathless, and collapse, antipsychotics, lengthening QT, dizziness, breathless, collapse from ventricular tachycardia. And I hope you don't see ventricular fibrillation too often. Thank you.